Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrew Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly podcast where I try my best to answer some of your questions. And let's jump in. I, as some of you may know, I was just in Scotland last week. I had the huge honor of helping my very good friend Kate Bergie celebrate her marriage to Opie. And so I'm just back from that. I have one special souvenir to show y'all from my trip. Um, but it was a really amazing week. And I think I am I'm about two to three days out from being back home. I think I'm through the jet lag. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, so hang in with me today. Hopefully this goes smoothly. I am wearing my hand spun DRK everyday cowl and hoping I can beat the storm that's about to begin any minute here. We are supposed to have quite a doozy of a thunderstorm, including maybe some hail. So I'm trying to get this recorded uh, while it's still kind of quiet because <laughs> this, if you didn't know, my studio is on the third story of a very old house and it gets loud up here if it's windy and it can get pretty darn windy here. So anyways, are we ready? All right. So question number one, I am in the middle of knitting my hand spun a tune shawl and loving it. Yay. I began knitting with a gray as my main color and a scrappy spin as my contrast. I love how the solid gray gives the edge definition, but I really love how the wrong side of the fabric is looking with all of the contrast pops of color standing to the front. As I transition to the garter section, is there a way to make the wrong side the right side of the brioche? Thanks in advance for your help. So I had a couple thoughts on this one. Here is my, I grabbed my attune, which is sticking to bits of things that need to be cleared off my desk. Uh, but here is my attune. And the first thing I'm going to say is there is really no right or wrong side to the shawl. When I pick it up and put it on, I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head which side was the right side or the wrong side. So you 100% could just keep going as you are and just know you can wear it however you want. It is a totally reversible shawl. So you don't have to do anything. But if you really want to see that contrast color doing what your gray is currently doing on the quote unquote right side of your shawl, you can make that happen. All I would do is basically just swap them. So start using your scrappy hand spun as your main color following those instructions and switch your gray to your contrast color. Um, the one thing I'm thinking that you may be thinking about is how you want to keep your gray as the border and I think that you can do that. It has been a hot minute since I knit this pattern myself. I have knit it twice, um, but up until the final garter section, you do keep the border solid. Once you get to this final garter section, it actually becomes striped at the edge. Um, so if you want to keep it in garter, if you want to keep your border in the gray, just keep working those border stitches in the gray and then pick up your, um, scrappy hand spun as your main color. I sound a little scratchy, don't I? Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I guess I'm still getting over that jet lag. Um, so yeah, it's totally doable. Uh, but keep in mind, you could also keep it as is and just wear whichever side you want out. And also the fun thing about shawls is generally speaking, you are going to see both sides of it as you wear it. You know, the way that fabric drapes, you tend to get peaks of both sides. Another brioche question. My question. I am super stumped over brioche knitting. Um, I'm just going to jump. This is kind of a longer question, so I'm going to summarize it a little bit. Um, I heard you say in and on the If I Want To episode that if you're having trouble uh, with brioche, start with the Harlow hat first. So that's what I did. I figured out the stitch pattern pretty well, found my rhythm, and I'm enjoying it. However, I'm having a lot of trouble knowing how to fix mistakes. Even if I unknit, I just make a mess of things. Is there any kind of tutorial about fixing mistakes during brioche? 
I'm used to finding and fixing all kinds of problems with regular knitting, but the brioche is just one big mystery. So I, this is one of the most frequent questions I get asked in regards to brioche because in general, fixing brioche mistakes is a little bit trickier, especially before you truly know the construction of that fabric. The more you knit brioche, the more you will understand the construction of the fabric, the easier it will be to fix the mistakes. The only way to learn how to fix brioche mistakes is to make mistakes and try to fix them. So I have given my lifeline spiel 1,010,895 times, but I'll do a quick recap of it right now. Basically use a lifeline. You can hear me talk about exactly how to do that on previous episodes. I'm actually gonna write myself a note. I know I need to actually do a little tutorial on that. So lifeline to um, but here's why I recommend a lifeline. It's not just because brioche mistakes are tricky to fix. It's because you will have a greater rate of success fixing those mistakes if you have a lifeline in place. That being because it takes away a lot of the stress. If you mess it up, it's okay. Just drop down to your lifeline, put your needle back in and keep going as though it never happened but it gives you the security blanket, this insurance policy, so that you can try to fix those mistakes. And again, the only way you're gonna learn how to fix them is by trying. So put that lifeline in, and that way when you do go in there and you're trying to fix that mistake, you know it's okay, no matter if, it, if you succeed or you fail, it's gonna be just fine. Now, as far as fixing British mistakes, I personally have never recorded blah, 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 blah recorded a tutorial for this, but there are loads of them out there. In fact, if you just search on YouTube for fixing brioche mistakes, you're going to see a handful of them. And I have even seen a class dedicated to this on School of Sweet Georgia. So there are definitely videos and things you can watch out there to start to guide you. I'll also say that Nancy Martian's book, Knitting Fresh Brioche, has pictorials on fixing brioche. So if you are falling in love with brioche, as I hope that you are, um, just know that book is such a great resource. It not only offers pictorials on how to brioche, it also has stitch patterns, full on patterns, and those how to fix little demos. So that is a great, if you're like me and you like to have a library of knitting books, um, that's a great one to add to the library. So I'm just going to make a little note here. I'll go ahead and link a few of the videos I've seen um, and that book for anyone who would like to check them out. But again, the way that I got pretty decent at fixing brioche mistakes is because I was just doing it all the time. Between designing brioche and teaching brioche, I have fixed a lot of brioche mistakes where now I have no qualms about just taking my needle out and getting it back into my brioche because I've done it enough that I really understand what's happening in that fabric. But it really takes practice to get there. I mean, at the end of the day, anything we want to do well, we need to practice to get us there. Whether it be putting colors together, fixing brioche, uh, shaping, having nice increases and decreases. I mean, there's just things all along the way that you're going to continue to learn and pick up that's going to help support you in having the most joyful knitting experience because the less amount of stress we can have involved, I think, in our creative pursuits, probably the better, right? I mean, I think some people maybe feed off of that stress. Personally, I try to lead with joy. I want my making to be as joyful as possible. Um, so it's always, there's just always more to learn. And by practicing, you're gonna get hands-on learning experience. So there you go. I hope that helps. <laughs> All right, newbie spinner and returning hardcore to knitting. My question is around note taking. I immediately went to note taking on my projects, both knitting and spinning, but I'm finding I'm missing some key information as well. Learning as I go. Yay. <laughs> I also know that collecting too much info will overwhelm me. I feel you on that one. My question to you is what do you find or consider capturing for your spin projects and or knit projects. So I think this could almost be a video unto itself. 
Um, I'm actually going to go ahead. This might be a breakout video, y'all. I'm just going to make myself a new note. Okay. Um, but the main thing I kind of wanted to touch on with this is I agree with it. If it's too much information, it's going to feel daunting and you won't stick with it. At least I know that's how I, how I go. So I would start with more information though and take away the stuff you just find you aren't utilizing when you look back on your notes. So for instance, when I first started my spinning journal, which I have shown, um, I wonder if I can link back to that video. I'm going to, I'm going to look, I'm going to see if I can find it for y'all. Um, so I did make a spinning journal on my iPad using good notes. That is my favorite digital note app. I love it. It has completely changed how I take notes for my projects, especially for spinning. For me, I needed something that I could easily include photos for. And so that is why pen and paper note taking wasn't working for me as far as my spinning went because I needed the visual. I wanted to see what the fiber looked like before I spun it, while I was spinning it, after I spun it, if I made it into something, what did that project look like? Like I needed it to be photo heavy. So digital just was the way to go for me. And that is coming from someone who is very anti-digital notebooks and things for a long time because my brain just tends to work better with tactile pen and paper. I feel like I take in information better. Like I can't read a book on a tablet or an iPad or a Kindle or things like that. For some reason, I feel like the information just doesn't go into my brain. Like it needs to be a paper book. Um, but with my crafting notes, I have found it to be so valuable. So um, I'll write that down here too, because I know I've been asked a few times. So the app I use is called Good Notes, and I really love it. Um, so for my spinning journal, I did start by including everything that people kind of recommend that you do. So I do have more than one spinning wheel, so I put what spinning wheel I use, what whirl I use, um, how many plies, what's my plan, where was the fiber from, what's the fiber content, how I'm going to draft the fiber, um, all of that kind of stuff, twists per inch, um, wraps per inch, pre-spun weight, post-spun weight, like all the yarn specs for after the yarn is finished, after it's completely dry, what was the finished yardage I got, what weight did that yarn end up being, fingering, sport, decay, etc. cetera. Um, so I put, I jam packed it with all the things. And now that I have been record keeping for my spinning for a couple of years, I've realized like there are certain things I don't reference. Twist per inch. Y'all, I would love to get a handle on twist per inch, but I think I feel about TPI, how some people feel about gauge swatching for their knitting projects where I'm like, I feel like I can make it be whatever I feel like. Like when I measure it, I feel like it could be so many different angles um, that I haven't been utilizing that measurement very much. Um, so that's one that I haven't been really worrying about having on in my notebook. I may get back to it. Maybe one of y'all can tell me how to utilize it better. That's a sticking point for me, that one. But anyways, over time, you're going to notice, you know, I never re-reference what thing I used or how I did it. And then you're also going to notice like, oh my gosh, I am so excited and happy and relieved that I thought to take a note of how I drafted, of how many times I stripped that braid down to get that color effect. Um, so definitely I actually take probably better notes of spinning and sewing than I do with my knitting. Um, because I have found that I want to replicate things more. Like when I sew, I will sew that garment more than once. Um, with knitting, my note taking is going to be quite a bit different than somebody who's not designing. I take notes that are just very design specific. Um, that being said, things I did find very helpful before I started designing to take notes on are definitely the size you are knitting 
and the needles you end up using, you will be amazed at how often we forget those things where we're like, oh my gosh, it has been, I set this project down for six months because I got excited about something else, just assuming I would remember. I mean, this literally just happened to my friend Becca who had put um, cord toppers onto a project. She needed her needle tips for a different project. She went back to that project and was like, I have no idea what size needle I was using. <laughs> so take notes of things like that because it really is important and you're going to want that information. The other things I love to take notes on, I, I do remake a lot of my knitting patterns. And so one thing I like to not have to think about again is like my sleeve decreases. So I'll actually say what rows I decreased on. That way, even if I'm only going to knit that sweater once, when I do the second sleeve, I don't have to sit there and count or measure my decreasing because I just use a row counter and know, okay, on rows, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I have to do my decrease. And now all I have to do is make sure I'm clicking my row counter and that's all the thought I have to put into it. But it's especially nice if you go to knit a pattern again and you have all that info. Or even if you wanna make some adjustments, you're like, okay, I love how I made this, but now I think I could try making it cropped or longer or at pockets. And it's just nice to have information. So start with more information than you think you're gonna want. Figure out after a couple months, what aren't you utilizing? Scrap that to simplify it so it's something you'll stick with. Um, and don't worry about, unless you get really filled up on journaling and you love to make it pretty and all those things, if that doesn't fill you up, don't do it. I actually like to keep pretty minimalist, simple journals when it comes to tracking my makes because if I try to get too flowery with it, I burn out and I stop doing it. So for me, I'm doing it because I want that information. I know I'll utilize it again in the future. And so I do whatever I need to, to stick with the habit. Um, so anyways, there are some of my thoughts on that. I kind of went for a while on that one, but I hope that's helpful. Um, and yeah, just be open to it evolving over time taking out information you're not using, adding new information you wish you had. Um, but I do find it's really worth it to be able to look back and know exactly what you did because at least for me, I just won't remember um, as much as I wish. It all just stayed locked in. It just doesn't. Okay, next question. I am getting ready to knit my second sweater. I will be knitting ochre moss. I have begun with the sleeves and I'm confused. So this question I included, especially for those of you who don't love knitting from charts, um, I thought this was a good one to clarify. So the part that they are confused about is they don't understand what it means when the pattern says, repeat rounds one through six from the stitch pattern chart, repeating the six round two stitch repeat across the round. It's a lot. I get how that's just like, whoa. Um, honestly, it's written that way to be technically correct, but it's a lot of information. So let's break it down. Really, all it's telling you is when you look at the chart, I wish I had a little chart to hold up. Um, so I'm just going to quickly draw. So we need this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, it's in the round, so we'll do it like this. And let's just do it. Boom, boom, boom. All right, this is not a real chart. <laughs> I am just sketching something to give you a really random idea. Um, I'm not even going to worry about that part. One, two, three, four. Well, now I've changed my mind. Okay. Oh, Andrea, I just made that so confusing. <laughs> this is why... People edit videos, but I won't because I don't know how. Okay. 
We're gonna really simplify this now. Again, just keep in mind, this is not from the pattern. I just wanna give you an idea. Okay, ignore this one. So we have a chart. It is six rows. So that means that the pattern, so if this was filled in with a little pattern, bloop, I'm just gonna add a little pattern to this. Pretend it's more interesting than it is. Okay, all this is saying is that the pattern repeats every six rows. So every six rows you are going to do, you're gonna just keep working those six rows again and again and again. And then the other part it's saying is that it is a two stitch repeat. So let's say this is, you're using two different colors. Let's say the white square represents your main color. The one with the dot represents your contrast color. So all that means is that you are gonna repeat this little two stitch repeat all the way across the round for however many stitches you have. So it would just be knitting one stitch with main color, one with contrast, one with main, one with contrast, one with main, one with contrast, all the way across the round, repeating those six rounds again and again and again. Okay, so that is that first part of it. All it's telling you is that it's a two stitch repeat across the round, boom, 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 and the, and it's six rounds deep. So you knit rounds one through six, and then you go back to one and start again, one through six, go back to one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. cetera. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. The next part is an at the same time question. So when we're knitting a sleeve, if we're knitting it from cuff up, it's gotta grow. It generally, we don't just knit a straight tube for a sleeve, you could, but generally we want our sleeve to be bigger um, where our arm gets bigger and smaller where our arm gets smaller. So um, the next part of this question is, at the same time, beginning with round three of the chart, work a sleeve increase. So all that means is that as you're going to keep working, sorry, we're using this chart as the example. You're gonna keep working this chart just as it looks. But once you get here to round three, that is going to be your increase round. That's all it's saying. And then you just stick with the chart besides that. So I hope that helps clarify. Um, you can always email our pattern help, which is on the last page of your pattern, if you need any further help with that. Um, but it's just trying to clarify how to follow that chart. Like when you are working a chart in the round, you're always going to start on the right side of your chart and work across the row. I think this might be mirrored for y'all. I don't know if it flips in processing. Um, so hopefully it does, so I'm not confusing you. Um, but you always read from right to left when you are knitting a chart in the round. If it was knit flat, you would go right to left, left to right, going back and forth. Anyways, we could probably talk a lot about charts. I will also say that Tin Can Knits has a great chart reading blog post. I'm just gonna add a note for it. Uh, to help those of you, I know, I mean, I've had some of you get borderline a little angry about the, the, the chart discussion can be very polarizing. Um, I know some of you just really don't like charts and for you it is just a hard pass. You're not gonna do it. Um, so I totally get that. But if you're like, man, there's patterns I wanna knit and they use charts, I wanna figure this out. Um, then I think that that blog post is a good place to start. And I also have seen sometimes local yarn shops will have classes on reading charts because sometimes it's just so nice to have some like in-person help with things like that. Um, and if they're not for you, they're not for you. But if you're curious and you want to tackle it, there are resources out there to hopefully get you started. All right, we did it. And the storm has not hit yet. Oh, so I do have something fun to show you. Um, I am going to hope that I pronounce this right. I actually looked up how to pronounce it. So while I was in Scotland, my good friend Casey found us some Scottish spindles. So this is called 
Jalligan in Gaelic, uh, but it's a Scottish spindle and it's a drop spindle. Um, it has this cool little cross hatching here. So the one video I've watched on how to use it, they actually tied a leader on and you do like a little half hitch here under this lip um, and then just drop and and then you can make a center pole ball right on the shaft there. Uh, so anyways, this is, I'm going to try this out with my next little bump of fiber. As far as Tour de Fleece, y'all, I'm so behind. I, I think I did a couple things. Not, not, I don't want to say not good. <laughs> But I think I kind of burned myself out a little bit prepping for tour where I decided I had to clear off everything. I had to be done with all my current spinning projects. And so I really did a crazy amount of spinning to finish up some languishing projects uh, before the tour. And I have had so much fun spindle spinning. It's definitely slower for me. Um, so I also just wasn't able to keep up with it as much as I would have liked to because it's just a slower way of spinning for me. Um, and I really had every intention of spinning every single day while I was in Scotland and that just didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, jet lag's a beast and we were busy with wedding stuff so anyways I am still catching up but I'm having fun catching up and now I'm excited that I get to try out my new Scottish spindle to try for one of my little bumps of fiber but once I'm done with it all I will definitely show everyone all of that and there was something else I wanted to share now I can't remember oh it's my birthday next week. <laughs> so if you have been following along pretty much since the beginning of me designing patterns, I have done a birthday sale every year and it tends to be my biggest sale of the year. So this is a really, really good time to sign up for my newsletter. You can find a link for that below. Um, but it is my birthday next week and it is a big birthday, which translates into a big discount for you. So definitely sign up for the newsletter and keep an eye out. Um, that sale will start early next week. So yay, I hope you'll help me celebrate. And besides that, I hope that you have a fabulous weekend. I am just going to be cuddling up on my kiddos and Spicy Pete. Feels really good to be back home with them and planning. Now that I'm back with my fiber and my yarn, it's time to get back into knitting and making mode. So I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you get to spend some of it making. And I especially hope to see you back here next week. Bye.